Hello and welcome to chapter 11. Today we're going to look at 11.1 .1, which deals with three-dimensional coordinate systems. Now so far we've been dealing with two-dimensional or 2D coordinate systems which is occurring on a Cartesian plane. Um, in order to identify a point in space we need what we call a third dimension. Now when we model this in a third dimension this is called a solid analytic geometry. And what we're going to do this by adding what we call a z-axis, and this z-axis will go perpendicular to the x and y axes. When we do this, and I will show you pictures of these here in just one second, but we are going to form an xy plane, an xz plane, and a yz plane. Now these three planes will create eight octants, and the first octant will start where all three, X, Y, and Z, are going to be positive. Then we're going to rotate around in a, clock, in a counterclockwise direction, just like we would as if we were looking at a two-dimensional coordinate plane. And then quadrant five will fall under quadrant one and will continue to rotate around in the counterclockwise direction as well. And again, I have pictures of these here coming up in just one second. Now, this right here, is our z-axis that runs perpendicular to our x and y-axis. You can see that we have our xz, yz, and xy planes. And our point is actually kind of out here in space. It's not touching this plane, it's not touching this plane or this plane, but it's kind of hanging out in space. Now this screen here shows us where the eight octants are located. And if you note, Notice here, octant 1 is going to be in, this is the positive x direction, positive y direction, positive z direction. So our octant 1 occurs where all x, y, and z are positive. Octant 2 has a positive z, positive y, negative x. So we're actually going in this direction when we're doing our um, rotation because we're going counterclockwise around the z-axis. And then quadrant 3 falls where x is negative, y is negative, but z is positive. Octant 4 has a positive z, negative x, positive, I'm sorry, negative y, positive x. Octant 5 falls below octant 1 and has a positive x, positive y, negative z. Octant 6 is a negative x, positive y, negative z. Octant 7 belongs in the negative x, negative y, negative z. And octant 8 falls in negative y, positive x, negative z. So octants 5, 6, 7, and 8 all have negative z values. Octants 1 through 4 all have positive z values. This here is just an example of how you would plot your 3D coordinate points. And if you notice, this here is our positive x direction. This is negative x. This is our positive y, negative y. We have positive z and our negative z direction. So when we look at this point right here, Negative 2 means I'm going to go back 2 in the x direction, over 6 in the y direction, and then up 1 in the, or I'm sorry, up 2 in the z direction. Now example 1 says to plot the given points. Um, what I did is I, I have this graph paper that I have here on the screen available for you in the class. Uh, it looks just like the graph paper without the blue coordinate system on it. Um, what I do when I graph on this paper is I go ahead and I, I, I just pick and draw in a set of axes for X, Y, and Z, just as I've done here in the blue, and then I've got kind of a, an origin to start or to kind of base my points off from. So to plot part A, I have to go negative 1 in the X direction. So here's negative 1. Then I'm going to go 3 in the positive right direction, so 1, 2, 3. And then up 4, so 1, 2, 3, 4. 
that gives me this point, so we'll call that A. Point B is 2 in the positive, so 1, 2. 5 in the positive Y, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And 0 in the Z, so this here is point B. And point C comes from going negative 1 in the X, negative 3 in the Y, and negative 6, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 in the Z. So here's C. And D comes from going 2 in the positive X, negative 1 in the Y, and 4 up. 1, 2, 3, 4 in the Z. So this would be D. Now, when we're dealing with 3D coordinate systems, we can still use the distance and midpoint formulas. They're very similar with the 2D formulas with the exception that now we're going to incorporate the Z coordinate points. So you can look at the distance and midpoint formulas here and we're going to apply them uh, in just one second. I wanted to include this diagram just for you to look at um, so you can kind of get an idea as to when you need to use all three points versus when you need to use two. If you look at this picture right here, go, if I'm going to use something that is on the same plane, like if I look at this triangle here, I notice that from this point here to this point here, I have the same Z values. So because I have the same Z values, those are going to actually cancel out of my distance formula. So then it just becomes an A squared plus B squared underneath the radical. Now in the case of this side over here, when I'm going to two different points that have that don't lie on the same plane, in other words, I have an x1, y1, z1, and an x2, y2, z2, then I'm actually going to calculate the distance. This a squared is really the difference of your x values, b squared is the distance of your y values, and c is the distance of your z values. So I just wanted to make that um, distinction because I didn't know if that would confuse anybody if you looked at this image in your book. Now example two says to find the distance between and the midpoint of the segment joining these two points. So let's start out with the distance. I know that this is equal to the square root of my x values, which is 3 minus 0 squared, plus my y values, which is 1 minus a negative 1 becomes 1 plus 1 squared, plus your z values, which is 4 minus 2, the quantity squared. When we simplify this, we have the square root of 3 squared, which is 9, plus this 2 squared, which is 4, and 4 minus 2 is 2. 2 squared will give us another 4. So we end up with 9 plus 8, essentially, which gives us the square root of 17. Now for our midpoint, we're going to add up our x-coordinates. So I have 3 plus 0 divided by 2, comma. Then I'm going to add up my y points, which is 1 plus a negative 1 divided by 2. And our z values, which are going to be 4 plus 2 divided by 2. And when we simplify this, I end up with 3 halves, 0, and 1. And just as when we were dealing with a 2D coordinate system and we were dealing with a circle, now we have a 3D coordinate system so we can deal with um, shapes like spheres. Now when we're dealing with a sphere, the general equation is very similar to that of a circle, um, but we have to add that third dimension. So now we have a center point that is h, k, and j. We still have the radius r, and the equation of our sphere is going to be given by the quantity of x minus h squared plus the quantity of y minus k squared plus the quantity of z minus j squared equals your radius squared.
Now example four says to find the center and radius of the sphere that's given. Now we have a lot of terms here. And the first thing you're going to want to do is you're going to want to group your like terms. So I'm going to get all of my x terms together. So I have x squared, which is this term, plus 4x. And then I'm going to add that to my y squared stuff, or my y terms, I'm sorry. And I have minus 2y. plus my z term, so I have z squared and a plus 8z. And then I'm going to take all my constants over to the other side, so that's going to give me a minus 10. Now, what I'm going to do with this is I'm going to complete the square of each term for my x's, my y's, and my z's, and then solve. So to complete this square, if you remember, you're going to add half of your b term here and square it. So half of 4 is 2 squared gives me 4. And if I add 4 on the left, I also have to add 4 on the right. For my y term, half of 2 is 1. So 1 squared becomes plus 1. So I'm also going to add a 1 over on the right. And then for my z term, I have half of 8 is 4, so I'm going to go plus 4 squared, which is really 16, and I'm going to add a 16 over here. So when I simplify all of this, we end up with x squared plus 4x plus 4 is going to simplify down to x plus 2, the quantity squared plus I have y minus 1, the quantity squared, plus the quantity of z plus 4 squared, and this is going to equal a negative 10 plus 4 plus 1 plus 16 is really equal to 11. So now I'm going to find my center by looking at this term, this term, and this term. So I have a negative 2, a positive 1, and a negative 4 for my center point, and my radius is equal to this term squared, which is really the square root of 11. So here is my center and radius. The last thing we're going to look at in this section is what we call the trace. And the trace is actually the intersection of a surface with one of the coordinate planes. And the trace will be a 2D equation when we get down to it. And we're going to look at that here in example four, or the next example. Okay, example five says to find the equation of the xy trace circle of the following sphere. Now, because we're looking at the xy trace, that tells me then that I'm going to set z equal to 0. Now when I do that, I end up with the quantity of x minus 2 squared plus the quantity of y minus 3 squared plus, and I end up with 0 plus 6 squared equals 49. So now I have to simplify this, and we end up with the quantity of x minus 2 squared plus the quantity of y minus 3 squared. This 6 squared is 36. I'm actually going to move that over. So then I end up with equals 49 minus 36 is 13. So my xy trace then is the circle that is centered at 2, 3 and has a radius equal to 13. So we can actually go ahead and sketch that if we had to on a 3D or on a graph. And for your fun fact tonight, please go to Edmodo, take your quiz, and your fun fact will be on Edmodo. Thank you and have a good night.